This morning I kind of want to go over a story of, of the ten lepers, which will be in Luke 17. As Pastor Nick has been going over, we see this walk of Jesus' life. Jesus' life as he's on the road to Jerusalem. Now, it's not the physical road. He's headed exactly to Jerusalem, point A to point B, but it's on the road, as we see in the beginning of, in the middle of Luke, where it says his eyes are on Jerusalem. So he knows where his, his picture is. He knows that that's where he's going to end up. That's where he, he knows he's being led to. So Jerusalem is that picture of where he's heading with his followers. And we've seen this, this big picture of Jesus as he's doing all these miracles. And this morning we'll look at a pretty miraculous miracle with ten lepers. But the thing that we notice is he, he's, he's actually been healing a, a multitude of people. Throughout Luke there's this, this verbiage a lot of healing a lot of multitudes. Even after he heals some, somebody, he kind of stays in the area and continues to heal several others. They don't tell every single story of every single healing. They only tell us the stories of the, some of the healings, but then in between we also see that picture of healing of a lot of different people. Some of the people that would have been healed is in the same area that we see in Luke 17 in the area of between Samaria and Galilee. One of the things that we see is Jesus' is healing too. He gets a lot of followers. Once you heal somebody, you're going to have a lot of people that follow you because you're doing something pretty miraculous anyway. But, but you also get this sense when we look at even Jesus when he feeds the 5,000. We see this picture of he feeds the 5,000 and then they keep coming back to him. Luke doesn't necessarily specify all the details, but we see a little bit more detail in John. So in John chapter 6, we see this, this feeding of the 5,000 done something great, something miraculous. The thing is, is that the Jews had been looking for a Messiah. They'd been waiting for somebody to come to save them. In their picture of wanting somebody to save them, we see this a little bit in John where he speaks of knowing their hearts. Jesus and in John 6, 14 through 15, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they, had, that they were intending to come and take him by force and make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. He's doing all these miracles, and the people come to him, and he knows that they're going to take him by force. It's, it's in their heart that they want to set him on the pedestal. They want him as king. They don't want a savior that we see in Jesus that we can look back and see kind of the hindsight, 2020. During their picture, they would have seen a Messiah and they would have wanted a savior, but they would have wanted a savior that was healing them, doing, doing all these great things. So he was, he was healing, but they wanted to set him on this pedestal. Hey God, we're going to put you as king. We're going to overthrow everybody else, kick the Romans out. It's just going to be you. You're going to be placed as high king. That's where we want you. You can heal all the Jews, heal us, give us those blessings, put us in, into the place where we want to, right? Just after that, in John 6, 26, a few verses after, he, you, you hear the story, you know the story of Jesus walking on water. He sends his disciples across Galilee. And the, what you hear just after that is that these multitudes that had been fed from the 5,000 had actually come after him. They, had, they don't really say how many there were, but they had come after him and said, Jesus, you know, where'd you go? Where are you? Like, we were going to put you in this high place, try to make you king. Jesus responds to him. So as Jesus answered them, said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You see, Jesus saw their heart and where they were at. They wanted to put Jesus on his pedestal as being the king, and Jesus knew exactly what, what they wanted. And Jesus said, You don't want to put me in that high place because you saw signs. The signs of, of the Messiah who's, who's standing in front of you. You saw these signs and great wonders of being fed and you want more. 
As Pastor Nick went over through chapter 16 last week, we got to know a little bit more about even that same heart, the heart of our money and what we do with our money. Today we get to look a little bit more at the heart of what we see as health. You see this picture of 10 lepers. The 10 lepers would have been a pretty bad, would have been a pretty bad place. If you were one of the 10 lepers, that would have been an awful place to be. So this morning I want to just open up and read through so we can go through everything. And then after that we'll kind of cut it down verse by verse and go through it again. If you guys would just open up and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray and ask that your spirit would come. We ask that we'd be able to hear your word, to know what you have to say to us. We also just ask that you just place that onto our hearts so we, we know that we need to test and try ourselves. May you test and try ourselves to, to know our heart, to know where our faith is, Father. Thank you for the, this text, and we just ask and pray that you would just be with this morning. Amen. So, we'll open up. We're going to go through verses 11 through 19. So, if you guys open up to Luke 17, I'll start reading 11. And it came about, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men, who stood at a distance, met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And it came about as that they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell at his feet. He fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go in your way. Your faith has made you well. So one of the things I want to go over first is what's leprosy? We kind of see this picture of leprosy. You may know or have heard about leprosy before. Um, maybe you haven't. Leprosy attacks the skin, peripheral nerves, especially near the wrists, elbows, and knees, and mucous membrane. It forms lesions on the skin and can disfigure the face by collapsing the nose and causing a folding of the skin, leading some to call it lion's disease due to the resulting lion-like appearance of the face. Contrary to popular belief, leprosy does not eat away the flesh. Due to the loss of feeling, especially in the hands and feet, people with the disease wear away their extremities and faces unknowingly. The horrible disfigurement caused by leprosy made it greatly feared and caused lepers to be outcasts, cut from all health society for protection. So leprosy wasn't a skin-eating disease. Leprosy was, was uh, eating away of the nerves. There's a famous doctor that came from India that was called Dr. Brand that actually has done a lot of uh, work and research with lepers. Uh, they just passed away in the early 2000s. And one of his stories is he was working with lepers. We, we now kind of call it in the medical field today Hansen's disease. That's the closest thing that we see with leprosy. Dr. Brand was working with leprosy and he was working with, over in India with um, many different people. One morning though, he, he went to his clinic. On his clinic, he had a lock. Just so happened his lock was rusty. So as he went to go open, open it up, but he couldn't. Full grown man, couldn't open the lock. One of his patients, 10 year old boy, was with him that he was, that he was working with, treating. And the 10 year old boy said, hey, you know, can I try? So Dr. Brand let him try and all of a sudden uh, the boy turns and the lock opens. Dr. Brand immediately thinks, is this, you know, did I see right? Is it this, this boy is so much stronger than I am? Or Shortly thereafter looking, he notices some blood dripping, looks down and checks to inspect the, the young boy's hand and finds that the boy had no, no sensory. So he had turned the key into the lock and it actually had cut down to the bone. But he got the lock open. So it's leprosy that we had see 
that debilitates the nerves so you just don't know you don't have that feeling you don't have that sensory so you don't know when there's a problem that would be some of the physical effects of leprosy now we see some of the social effects of leprosy biblically we see that leprosy there's a lot of law based around leprosy on uh, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 and as we continue to see what, what Jews would, would do to lepers, is they would put them out of the camp, put them outside the outer wall. They would separate them for fear that they might get leprosy. Leprosy was contagious, so they, they didn't want to get too close. They wouldn't even touch the clothes. There were some priests that were actually said to not even buy food or bread on the same street that the leper may have been. So after they outcast the lepers, they put them outside the camp. They would have had law around that. Lepers were to always tell you they were unclean. If you were walking by and you were getting close, they would have to yell out, unclean, unclean, so you knew. They also had to stay six feet away from you. If the wind was blowing, they would have to stay 150 feet away from you. So depending on the weather, don't know if it's normally windy or not. Didn't really see that, but there was rules to being a leper. How many lepers have been healed at this point? Well, we see a couple. Earlier in Luke, we see a leper. In Matthew, we see one. It's kind of the same occurrence. So we see these two lepers that have been healed. Before that, Old Testament, how many lepers? So I, I usually teach with the teens, so I'm usually expecting a response. How many lepers were in the Old Testament that were healed? One. Naaman, right? So Naaman was a Syrian who was healed. And we see that even in the earlier accounts, when we see through Luke 4 and 5, when we see in Luke chapter 5 when he heals the leper, in Luke chapter 4... Luke goes back, or Jesus goes back to his, his own community, into, into his own town, into the synagogues. He's preaching, he's teaching, and the priests and everything are trying to really figure out who he is. Because he reads from Isaiah and says, uh, you've seen some prophecy fulfilled. Basically saying, you know... I'm he. I'm the guy who's been fulfilled, the prophecy of Isaiah speaking to someone who's coming that is greater, that's Messiah. So as he's speaking, you see this picture of the, the temple teachers, the, the teachers in the synagogue at that time. They start getting really, really mad, but they don't get mad until Jesus kind of explains to them what's happened. In Luke chapter 4, verse 27, He's talking about Elijah and Elisha and the different miracles that, that they would have seen with them. And said, Elijah helped out one woman who was a widow, and Elisha helped out one leper. In verse 27, there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha. But he only healed one leper. And the leper wasn't even a Jew. The leper was a Syrian. You see this, there's already a picture of the people in the synagogue that are already kind of have this expectation of, of, of what's right, what's fair, what's just. You're going to heal what should be fair and just. The Israelites are your people. You should heal them first. You should take care of us first. There was always a kind of a selfish connotation that you see with people, even when it came into the multitudes, when there was the feeding of the 5,000, the people that kept coming to Jesus. There was always this connotation of, of Jesus, I, I, I want healing. I want, I want something. So as we look at this picture in, of the 10 lepers in Luke 17, we see on his way to Jerusalem. He knows that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows the, the point where he's going. In Luke chapter 5, when he heals the other leper, he tells him not to tell anybody. Not because it was a bad thing, but because it just he didn't want too much attention because it wasn't his time. It wasn't God's timing yet of what his plan was. 
what happens are the multitudes still go out. They, everybody gets really, really chatty. Everybody finds out really, really quickly that Jesus is healing. And they come to him. And you see that he secludes himself. Even in John 26, in John, when we see afterwards, he says he secludes himself to, a, to an area by himself. It's not that Jesus doesn't want to heal everybody. It's that Jesus, that's, that's not what his purpose was. His purpose was not to come to earth to heal everybody that was sick and to become and put on a pedestal as king. Jesus had a different plan. So let's keep going through Luke 17. As it came about, as it came about while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. The area that he's already in is already an area that you see Samaritans in. We see that reference later to the one, one leper who's a Samaritan. He entered a certain village. Ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. So you see, even with the lepers, they're standing at a distance. They're following the law. The law would say, you know, don't get too close. Otherwise, you know, don't know what they would do other than pretty much just send them off and kill them. But they say, stand away, and they're listening. They're obeying what the law says. So they're standing away, standing from a distance. And as they come in, as Jesus comes in, you see the lepers. They raise their voice. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. It would have been in this picture, too, you would have understood that the, the many people that have been getting healed, the many people that Jesus has been showing miracles to, word has gotten around. Word has gotten around to these lepers. They would have known that Jesus had been healing a lot of people. And they immediately recognize who he is and say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Even the connotation of the word master that he uses uh, is not used by anybody other than his disciples. So they even use a term that his disciples use and, and it's, a, it's a term of, of endearment. It's a term of, of position. They set him apart. They know that he is bigger and greater than anybody else. And when Jesus saw him, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. When Jesus said, go and show yourselves to the priests, that made sense. Not yet, because they weren't cleansed, so they were lepers. So on their way to the priests, they would have wanted to make sure that they didn't have any leprosy when they got to the priests. The priests were kind of like the CDC that we see today. So they, uh, they were the ones that were medically the ones that would, that would uh, see people that were need that had leprosy and they were the only ones that could go through the ceremonial part to put them back into society and as we see before there's only Naaman who's been healed of leprosy and nobody else until Jesus's time we see this law in Leviticus that shows us what you would have to go through through the ceremonial process to be healed and to be put back in society as a leper there was about eight, an eight-day period where you'd have to go and they would test and make sure that the leprosy was gone. There was um, several things that you had to do with your clothing. Uh, even the clothing was, was to be disbanded. Um, facial hair, beards, hair, everything would be shaved. Uh, they would touch you in different places with oil. And there would be an eight-day period where they would watch to see if the leprosy had changed or if the leprosy was still there. And if it hadn't changed, then they would send you back in the outer part and you would live with the rest of the lepers. Now the part with the, the living with the other lepers as well is that once you were out there as a leper, that was your death sentence. That's like living on, on a life sentence or a death sentence that is coming to you and there's no way out. Because as a leper, no one else had been healed but Naaman. So it's not like any leper had seen many other lepers at all get healed to where they could even get through the ceremonial process. The ceremonial process partly was for people who would have had sores or other things that they might have thought was leprosy. They would go through an eight-day period to really see if it was leprosy or not. Even, you know, if you go through Leviticus, even bald men had to be looked at because they thought that that was actually part of, if you became bald, you could be leprous. 
but as long as you didn't have a white spot and a blemish that would come and form on your skin and then continue into leprosy, you were, you were still ceremonial, you were clean, and they never would take you and throw you out into the outer camp. But if you were thrown into the outer camp, that was, that was your life sentence. You were there pretty much knowing that there was nothing left. So as Jesus tells them to go show themselves to the priests, it came about while they were going that they were cleansed. And so it was finally on their trip, on their way to the priests, that they were cleansed. Don't know how, how quick, at what point, or what distance they were from Jesus when it happened. We just know that they were started going. So they started moving to head to the priests, and they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that, had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Now we kind of see three things that this guy does. One of the lepers that's healed, he, he does three things. He turns back and gives glory to God. He glorifies God, which is not what the others are doing. The others are headed off to the, to the priest. Now, even while they head off to the priest, they know that they have eight days that they still have to go through before they're accepted back into society. After those eight days, if the priest wasn't satisfied yet, you could sit there for another eight days and another eight days. So the priest could watch you longer if he thought that he wasn't for sure that it wasn't going to come back. Now, how many times have priests had to do this? Probably different times with sores and other stuff, but nothing to where it was really like, not, nothing to the point where a leper had come back, and leprosy that they knew was there was now all of a sudden gone. So you see this picture of these lepers, and they're headed off to the priest to make sure they get set for eight days, so that way they can get started to get past that point of eight days so they can get back into society, get back to where I was at. But the man that turned back, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. One of the reasons that they think it's significant with being that with a loud voice is that lepers a lot of time, not all of them, but most of them, leprosy would affect their larynx. So they couldn't really talk very well. And they were just barely able to speak. So even as they said to Jesus, have mercy on us, we don't really know how, how well he would have heard, don't know how many people would have been affected, but it could, it affected the larynx. So we see this picture of glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell at his face, at his feet. He put his position, he lays down at his feet, signifying that this man is, is great. This man is is. Not just great, but he's got some position of authority, some position of authority from God to be able to heal him. Whether he recognizes God himself, we, we see that a little bit later. But he falls at his feet, giving thanks to him. So he gives thanks to him. He positions himself at his feet on his face, glorifying God, and he's shouting praises in a loud voice, giving glory to him. And it's interesting at the end part of 16 that it says, and he was a Samaritan. So we see in the Old Testament a uh, leper who was healed who was a Syrian. Now we see in, out of these 10 lepers, it doesn't say what the race of all the rest of the nine are, but it at least tells us this man that had turned back was a Samaritan. Signifying something for even the disciples who are with Jesus. And Jesus responds to him kind of rhetorically and says, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Well, the man that's in front of him at his, at his feet that's glorifying him knows that there was ten men. The man that's at his feet that's glorifying God not only knows that there's ten men, but he knows where the nine are. He knows where the nine are because Jesus told him to go there. He said, go to the priest and show yourselves. Jesus, you just, you just told him to go to the priest. You know where they're at. Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? Foreigner, the word there was from another race. 
the term foreigner was not necessarily used in a, in a pleasant term, in a, in a good term. As him being a Samaritan, he wasn't Jewish. He wasn't from the same covenants that, that the, the Jews would have held themselves to be with. He wasn't even allowed to come into the temple, into the same place as, as where they were able to come. All the rest of the men were headed to the temple, to the priests, maybe even to glorify God, and maybe even to worship God at the temple. But we know that God wasn't at the temple. God was standing before him. And then in verse 19, it's interesting, because he said to him, Rise and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. We see this picture of your faith making you well in a few different places. The word there, too, is called zozo. Sozo is the term that's used in Luke 7.50, Luke 8.12, Luke 13.23, Luke 19.10. We see that with the woman pouring perfume on Jesus' feet that's wiping his, wiping his feet with her tears. He uses the term being saved, being made well. When he talks to Zacchaeus in verse 19, when he's talking to Zacchaeus, it's also the same term that is in the Greek that they, they talk about being saved. So being made well is not just God saying, your faith has made you well, as in your leprosy is gone. There's something greater than that. It's your faith has made you well spiritually. We see that all of them were physically healed. All ten were physically healed. And nine of them were off to the races to go show themselves to the priests so they could get on to the next step, the next procedure, so they could know that they were going to be accepted back into culture, into society. There was one who his faith was different than the other nine. His faith had turned back to glorify Jesus. And it is through his faith of turning back to Jesus, to giving thanks to God, to glorifying him, that Jesus says, your faith has made you well. It's only by God's grace, by Jesus' grace, that he's even being able to made well. We see that in different pictures when he's talking to the extent of when Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. The only one who could forgive sins is that of God. So Jesus is this person who is not the prophet that some thought he was, maybe even not the prophet that the other nine thought he was. Hey God, thanks for the healing. I'm off. Back with life. As I was going over this myself, it was kind of very convicting for myself. When you guys know with Heather's health, um, our marriage of 13 years now, at the beginning of our marriage, we have always kind of dealt with cancer. And I started tracing myself back to, to kind of what my own prayers were with my wife. A lot of my prayers were very much so that of the nine. My prayers came in to be, God, heal my wife so we can get back to life and continue with where we were at. I got a plan. I got a will. And my plan and will is to, to do this and get on with life. And if you heal her, we can get back to that. And by the way, I'll help out the church. I'll do some great things. You heal my wife, I'll, you know, I'll sing praises. I'll come to church every Sunday. We'll, we'll, we'll do lots of stuff. The problem with a lot of those prayers is they're very, very superficial, very, very selfish. Very selfish in the manner of they were just for myself in order to where I could get back to where I was going, where I was at. Sometimes I didn't really realize that, that God had put Heather into a place to slow us down, to, to show me a picture of something different, to show me a picture of who he wanted me to just stop and sit and worship. It's in those times that we, we do have to stop and sit and worship because we kind of feel like we're trapped. We kind of feel like we don't know what to do. When you're going through a trial or tribulation, there's a lot of people who have gone through something physically yourself, gone through something with your children, with your spouse, with family members, with somebody close to you. You would have gone through somebody that would have been 
physically, that you would just pray for healing. God, just heal this person. God, pray, I pray, and I want you to heal this person because that's what I believe is just. That's what I believe is fair. The Bible says that our, our knowledge, our minds are not of that, of his. His knowledge is much greater, and sometimes the things and the things that I pray for, I pray for because I'm a very, very baby in my faith. Very, very much so immature in my faith. Sometimes I realize that without going through some of the health concerns, I wouldn't be, and my faith wouldn't be where it's at today without God putting me there. You see, there's these two pictures of these people physically getting healed. And we all pray for that. We all want that healing. Scripturally, though, we see that he heals these ten lepers. One, he heals spiritually. He heals them in a way that we all want to get healed. We all want to get saved. But we're afraid of what happens when we don't get healed. As we can continue, continue to see, the Jews would have thought a lot of this. The Jews would have thought that leprosy, the sickness, the different diseases that were going on, came from a result of sin. So a lot of leprosy and the people that were looked at as lepers, it was they were lepers and it was a, it, they were getting punished for their sins. After this story, we continue to walk with Jesus and we get to, to John 9. John 9 is considered to be right after this, very, very shortly after this. In John 9, we see this picture of a blind man who's getting healed. And his disciples, this is his own disciples that have been walking with Jesus for the course of just about the last three years. And they ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? You see, they correlated a lot of blindness, paralytics, lepers, that they were getting punished by God for their sins. Jesus answered, It was neither that man that sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. God tells the Jews, It's, it's not, it's not the, the leprosy and the blindness because of their sin. It's their, they have been lepers and blind because God has some works to show. There's something great in God that he's going to show. Sometimes we don't always see that in our own lives. We see people that need healing. We don't see God working. We don't see his hand. We don't see where God's getting glory from that. But it's true. Romans 1.21 even continues to speak of these this picture that Paul is showing in Romans 1.21. For even they knew... They knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. You kind of see this picture of the nine where they knew God, they came face to face with him. They had enough faith in God to know that he could heal them and they were off to the next thing. There was one man who wasn't even a Jew who turned around, recognized who God was, and when he recognized who God was, fell at his feet to worship him. It's even more convicting in my own story when you really think of it that way because then all of a sudden you go back to all the different prayers you had when you asked for healing for somebody. And you really ask yourself, I, I had to ask myself, did I pray for my wife's spiritual health more than I prayed for her physical health? And I'd say no. I prayed for physical healing so we could get back to where we were at. I didn't necessarily pray for her spiritual health. I didn't pray that God would show himself to her in a greater way, even though he has. Time and time again, God has used this situation of health to increase my faith, to help me understand and really to picture of who God is 
And now when I look at God, there's nothing I can do but fall at his feet and give thanks to him. Because he's the only one that we can thank. As there's a lot of grandparents here, it's kind of that story of, of a, or a picture of being a grandparent. And you walk in the room and your grandkids come running to you. And it's a whole lot different when your grandkids come running to you because you got suckers and ice cream and, and candy in your hands and they run into you because they want your stuff. And there's a difference when your grandparents and there's nothing that you have for them. And they just run up to you and they love you because they, they, they love you. They run into your arms and they say, I don't care if you have stuff today. I just want to be here with you. So this is a picture, as, as we go through the ten lepers, this is a picture that we see of ten men who are healed. And the question might still be, what happens when you're not healed? There's a story of Johnny Erickson Tata, of someone who was on that other side, of someone who hasn't been healed. And this morning I want to show you a video, just to show you a little bit better of a picture of finding God in the midst of trial, through the midst of tribulation, through the midst of a tragedy, and to come on the outcome of on the other side where it's you don't get healed. So here in a minute I'll show you a video and it'll be about seven minutes, so just sit still for a little bit. I grew up in a very athletic family, tennis, horseback riding. My earliest memories of um, hearing about the God of the Bible, though, was around the campfire on the beach of the Delaware shore with my sisters, my mom and dad, hearing stories of Noah, David, Moses, Daniel. But God really, really, he, he really wasn't very personal. All that changed, though, when I was a 14-year-old kid, went away on a kind of a church weekend retreat. And I was challenged by the speaker. He said, Kids, I want you to measure your lives up against the Ten Commandments. Well, I had never committed adultery, or I don't think I, I stole anything in a big way, but you know what? It, it didn't matter. As I measured my life up against those commandments one by one by one, oh, I, I got this overwhelming sense that I'm missing the mark. I'm not going to make it. Oh, God, help me. It troubled me at first that God gave us a bunch of commandments that He knew very well we couldn't keep. But then it hit me at that weekend retreat. It hit me, that's why Jesus came. He was the one who kept the commandments. He was the one who obeyed the law, even though I didn't and even though I couldn't. I was only 14, but um, I was able to reach out right then and embrace Jesus and say, I, I need you. I, 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 I want to make it out of earth alive and you're my only passport, so please. Well, I came home from that weekend retreat, all fired up, all pumped, all excited. But then um, through high school, um, the enthusiasm of what I had done began to wane, especially when I started confusing the abundant Christian life with the great American dream. My prayers were so self-centered, like, uh, God, help me to lose weight. God, I need a new boyfriend. God, give me good grades on this test. Unfortunately, I guess I thought I had done God a great big favor by accepting Jesus as my Savior. And I remember right around my senior year of high school, I prayed, Lord, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this Christian thing right, and I know it. I don't want to go off to college and defame your good name, smear your reputation. I know it's about far more than just me, so do something in my life to jerk it right side up, because I'm really living this life wrong. Just a few weeks after high school graduation, as I was preparing to head off to college, my sister Kathy invited me to go to the beach for a swim. I swam out to this raft, athlete that I was, I didn't even touch bottom, hoisted myself up onto it and then took this really stupid dive into what ended up being extremely shallow water. I snapped my head back when I hit bottom and it crunched my fourth cervical vertebrae, severing my spinal cord. There I was lying face down in the water, desperately hoping that my sister Kathy would please notice that I had not surfaced from my dive. I, 
unbeknownst to me, her back was turned to me. She didn't even see me take that dive. But a crab bit her toe. And it so startled her that she quick turned around in the water, screamed to me, Johnny, watch out for crabs. And when she did, she saw my blonde hair floating on the surface. I was face down, ready to drown. She came swimming quickly, pulled me up out of the water. And I never, I never was so grateful for fresh air. She saved me. But for what purpose, for what reason? Because now, lying there in a hospital, doctors told me I was going to have to sit down for the rest of my life as a quadriplegic without use of my legs or, or even my hands. My hands don't work. And I remember thinking, God, is this, is this your idea of an answer to a prayer to be drawn closer to you? If it is, you're never going to be trusted with another one of my prayers again. I mean, I'm a new Christian. How could you have taken me so seriously? I sank into deep depression. I, I remember there were wonderful Christian friends who came to the hospital and they encouraged me. And one Bible verse they shared was from Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to help you, plans to prosper you and to give you a hopeful future. God, you, you mean you plan not to harm me? Well, what do you call quadriplegia, huh? What's that all about? As I read that verse and the context around it, I realized something, that when God said that, he was saying it to his children who were being dragged away into captivity by, by the Babylonians. They were going to exile. They were going into slavery. They had decades in front of them of hard, awful suffering. And I began to see that God's plans for a hopeful future for me was not necessarily jumping up, dancing, kicking, doing aerobics, running, walking, getting back use of my arms and my legs. No. God's plans for me go far deeper, a deeper healing a precious healing of the soul. Because as I was pushed into the arms of God every morning, and that's the truth, even to this day, don't be thinking I'm an expert at quadriplegia, but as it was then in the hospital and as it is today, every morning I wake up saying, Jesus, I can't do this thing called life. Please help me. Please show up, give me your smile, give me your strength, because I can't make it through the day. And because I go to God with that earnest dependency and, and requirement of His grace every single day, I take that back, no, every single moment, I experience the sweetest, most precious, most intimate union with Jesus Christ. So in Jeremiah 29, when God says He won't harm us, it doesn't mean the body doesn't mean our circumstances. He's not going to do anything to harm our soul. Yes, our body may get harmed, but it will somehow serve to enrich our soul. In closing, let me just say that quadriplegia, 46 years of it, that's a long time. I deal with chronic pain. I, um, I had breast cancer a couple of years ago, and I remember, I remember as my husband was driving me home in the van from chemotherapy one day, we were talking about how Suffering is like little splashovers of hell, kind of like waking us up out of our spiritual slumber. And then we, we pulled in the driveway and he said, well, then what do you think splashovers of heaven are? Are they those easy, breezy, bright times where everything's going your way, where you have health? And we said, no. Splashovers of heaven are finding Jesus in your splashover of hell. And to find Jesus in your hell is ecstasy beyond compare. And I wouldn't trade it for any amount of walking in this world. That's the story of a lady who hasn't been healed from some of the prayers that she would have liked to like to be healed and I come to find myself in the same position would I ever take away my wife's health if it would put me in a better place without Jesus and I'd say no I would rather experience suffering and be with Jesus 
than to be outside of that and to not know Jesus. So if you know somebody who's suffering or if you're suffering yourself, I just ask and pray that, that uh, you, would, you would look at those two different pictures of faith. Do we look at wanting to be healed? Do we look at wanting to be healed to get to the next step? Or do we look at wanting to be healed so that way we can really worship and praise and glorify God?